The prophet Isaiah is the great evangelical prophet of the Old Testament. The book of Isaiah itself, in a sense, reads like a Bible in miniature. There are 66 books in the Bible, and there are 66 chapters in the great prophecy of Isaiah. The first 39 chapters in the book of Isaiah really expose the sins of the people. And then the last 29 chapters of Isaiah bring a wonderful hope to the people of forgiveness and a new beginning. Just as the first 39 books of the Bible bring condemnation and really show the people their sins. And then with the opening of the New Testament and the uh, books of the New Testament, we have a wonderful, wonderful presentation of the gospel and all of the hope that the gospel brings. So the book of Isaiah is a Bible in miniature. It highlights our need for Christ. It highlights the person and the ministry and the work of Christ. And it also foretells the great coming kingdom of Christ, maybe in a way that no other Old Testament book does. And of course, Isaiah chapter 53 unveils the great atoning work of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. It's interesting that Isaiah 53 is written in the past tense. Although the events spoken of whenever they were written were yet future. And I believe that that just nails down the fact that the great work of redemption would be done. And in the mind of our God and in the mind of our Savior, the work was as good as done. Because the scripture said he would not feel And he would certainly not be discouraged. The cross work of Christ and the great work of redemption was never in any danger of failing. He would not feel, neither be discouraged. And you know, all of these great evangelical truths that are found in the book of Isaiah serve to comfort the child of God and the church of Jesus Christ. And they also bring great comfort to the sinner who feels his need of a Savior and wants to come to the cross. What comfort we find in the book of Isaiah. Indeed, one of the great rules that Isaiah fulfilled was the comforting of God's people. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. We are living in a world where many people's minds are in turmoil. Many people tonight in our world and many people in our society are living with fear and guilt. Many people are living with anxiety and loneliness. Others are struggling with the uncertainty of world events at this time. Others are fearful about the future. Some are confused as to what life is all about. Many tonight undoubtedly are living with shame and regret. A sense of failure and pain and loss in their lives. Depression and disappointment and discouragement and adversity. And the result maybe of some of these things or all of these things being compounded together. Many are living without purpose. Many are living without hope. And many need comfort. And the comfort that they need is the comfort that is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord. The comfort of the gospel. Tonight I want very simply to bring to your attention five components. Five things that comprise the hope of the gospel. And the first thing is this. A consciousness of God's salvation. A consciousness of of salvation. And they use the word consciousness to try to depict that salvation is something that we need to experience as a reality in our own lives. Something that we are conscious of in our own lives. Something that we have consciously experienced and consciously know to be a reality. You see, many people tonight undoubtedly know what salvation is, theoretically. They've been brought up in the church, they've been brought up under the sound of the gospel, 
But as far as they personally are concerned, there is no conscious reality or no conscious experience of salvation in their life or in their soul. Now you'll notice here in this first verse that God is speaking to his people. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith the Lord. He's speaking, therefore, to a people who belong to him. A people who have been brought to him. A people who are redeemed. And in verse number 2, he's speaking to a people whose iniquity is pardoned. And so I want to challenge you just on those two thoughts. First of all, are you a child of God? Do you belong to the Savior? Are you tonight one of God's people? The reality is that not everybody in this world is a child of God. Not all people are God's people. Many people believe in the universal fatherhood of God. That every person born into this world by nature and maybe even by birth, is a child of God. And friends, that is not true. That's not the teaching of the Bible. In fact, the Bible would explicitly teach us that by nature we are children of wrath, even as others. Jesus Christ our Lord said to the religious leaders of his day, Ye are of your father the devil. So not everybody tonight is a child of God. Jesus Christ said, ye must be born again. Are you conscious of that in your life? Of a time in your life's experience, somewhere back there in the past, of being converted and being born again by the Spirit of God? The eyes of your understanding being opened? Your will being renewed and changed? Your heart being opened to the truth of the Word of God? and then subsequent to that, being brought savingly to the foot of the cross in faith and in repentance. And you can look back and say, yes, I have been converted. I have been born again. I have believed the gospel, and I have put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Are you tonight a child of God? Has your iniquity been pardoned? Is your sin forgiven? You know tonight, sin needs to be forgiven. God doesn't wink at sin. God doesn't turn a blind eye to sin. God doesn't turn his back on our sin and just sweep it under the carpet. Sin has to be paid for. Sin has to be atoned for. Sin has to be covered. Sin has to be forgiven. And yet the Lord says here to the people of Jerusalem, Your warfare is accomplished. Your iniquity is pardoned. And I believe tonight in the gospel, God says that to the penitent sinner. Your warfare is accomplished. Jesus Christ has made peace through the blood of his cross. And by taking your sin upon his soul and upon his body upon the tree, he has slain the enmity between man and God. And he has dealt with our sin and dealt with the wrath of God and the anger of God and the justice of God. And he has made a wonderful sense of peace through the blood of his cross. Righteousness and peace are met together. Truth and mercy have kissed each other. And the warfare has been accomplished and Jesus Christ has dealt with our sins. And the iniquity of the penitent sinner is pardoned upon confessing that sin because that sin was dealt with at the cross. Is your sin tonight forgiven? There's a wonderful comfort in knowing that your sins are forgiven. No condemnation, Mr. Wesley said, now I dread. Jesus and all in him is mine. Alive in him my living head and clothed in righteousness divine. The great tragedy is that if your sin is not forgiven, you stand right now in danger of dying in that sin. In John 8 and 21, the Lord said again to the religious leaders of his day, ye shall die in your sins. Something that most people never think about. Most people never think about sin. And most people never think about dying in their sin. And that's the greatest tragedy that can happen to any individual, to die 
in your sin, to die without a Savior, to die unforgiven, unpardoned, unjust, unregenerate, unredeemed, unready. And yet tonight there's a comfort here in the gospel. Speak comfortably to Jerusalem. Tell her that her warfare is accomplished, that her iniquity is pardoned. Is your sin forgiven tonight? Has your warfare been accomplished? Are you living in the victory of the cross? Does God look upon you tonight as being a child of God? I just simply ask you this question. Are you saved? Are you saved? Are you a child of God? What a comfort it is to know that you're saved, that your sins are forgiven, that your soul has been redeemed, that heaven is your home, that you're no longer lost, and you've got peace with God. Well, did old Horatio Spafford say, when peace like a river attendeth my way, or sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. A consciousness of salvation brings a wonderful comfort to the child of God. And then there's something else, communion with the Savior. What wonderful comfort that brings. Verse number 3 speaks about the ministry, the preaching ministry of John the Baptist. And his ministry was to prepare the way of the Lord and to make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And you'll notice there in your English Bible, your King James Bible, that the word Lord is in capitals. And whenever you have the word Lord in your Old Testament Bible in capitals, it just comes from the Old Testament title for God, Jehovah. And here we have the ministry of John the Baptist, and he was called to prepare the way for Jehovah. And then whenever we come into the New Testament Scriptures, we have John the Baptist, and what was he doing? He was preparing the way for the preaching ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see tonight, Jesus Christ is Jehovah. And the ministry of John the Baptist was to call the people to behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He was ever pointing people to the Lamb of God, pointing people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever a sinner comes to the Savior... And they experience his mercy, his pardon, his forgiveness in their lives. Friends, that's only the beginning. In John 10, the Savior said, My sheep hear my voice and I know them. And they follow me. And he says, I take them up on my arms. And they'll never perish. And neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. It speaks about a wonderful life of fellowship and communion with the Savior. Whenever Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, and those believers in that particular church had been delivered from some of the vilest sins that you could think of, and they had been washed and sanctified and delivered. And in 1 Corinthians 1, in verse number 9, Paul reminds them, you have been called into the fellowship of his Son brought into fellowship with Jesus Christ. If we walk in the light, John said, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. And the Savior who stood at the door at the church of Laodicea and said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock and if any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him and he with me. And you see it here intimately in verse number 11 of Isaiah chapter 40. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. And he shall gather the lambs with his arm. And carry them in his bosom. Close to his heart that is. And shall gently lead those that are with young. What a wonderful comfort there is here in communion and fellowship with the great shepherd and bishop of her souls, the Lord Jesus Christ. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. You know, I love that account in John 4, whenever the Savior sat down beside the woman at the well and says, I have water to drink of, and if you drink of the water that I shall give you, 
you shall never thirst again. And then in John chapter 6, he spoke about the bread of life. And he says, whosoever eateth of this bread shall never hunger. And he that believeth shall never thirst. You see, he feeds his people. He satisfies the longing of the human heart. And then it says, he shall gather, he shall gather the lambs with his arms. Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for if such is the kingdom of heaven. Except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of God. And then it says, he shall carry them in his bosom. Not just lifting the little lamb that's lost and laying it upon his shoulders rejoicing. Yes, he does that. He lifts us and he lays us on his shoulders. And not only are our names graven upon the palms of his hands, but he carries the lambs of the flock. He carries his sheep in his bosom, in his very heart. Isn't that a wonderful thing? John was often found leaning in the Lord's bosom. Why? Because it was there that he found great comfort. And if we could only realize tonight, those of us that are saved and redeemed and forgiven and born again into the family and fold of God and lifted and loved and redeemed by the shepherd, just how dear and how precious we are to him, what a wonderful comfort that would be. He carries us in his bosom. And then it goes on to say, he shall gently lead those that are with young. Everybody needs led. We live in a wilderness, this world. And in this world, we need someone to lead us and someone to guide us. I love the words of the 23rd Psalm. He leadeth me beside the still waters. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I wonder tonight, do you know what it is to be lifted? Do you know tonight what it is to be loved? Do you know tonight what it is to be fed? And do you know tonight what it is to be filled? Do you know tonight what it is to be carried? And what it is to be comforted? Do you know tonight what it is to be guided and directed by the Lord? Can I ask you tonight, are you walking daily by the sea of your side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? This is part of the great comfort of the gospel. That yes, there's a consciousness of salvation. And there's also a communion with the Savior. But then there's something else that brings comfort to the child of God, the young convert. And that's the counsel of of scripture. Did you notice how many times in this wonderful portion of scripture that God's word is mentioned? Verse number one, comfort ye, comfort ye my people. Not says the prophet Isaiah, but comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. And then in verse number five, the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. And then in verse number 8, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Where does the Christian get their comfort from? From some feeling that rises up within them? That's wonderful if that happens. But feelings rise and feelings fall. Emotions come and emotions go. Our best intentions wax and wane. But whenever we come to the word of God, what comfort it gives us. Jesus Christ our Lord said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. But can I suggest to you and can I remind you tonight, if you're not a Christian, and you're not a child of God, the Word of God has nothing to offer, offer you by way of comfort so long as you remain in your sin and as you continue to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. The Word of God has got nothing by way of comfort to offer the impenitent sinner. Those that are stubborn and stiff-necked and rebellious and refuse to come, God's Word has got nothing to offer by way of comfort to the impenitent sinner other than a life without hope and an eternity without mercy. That's a solemn thing. But for those who want to know the Savior, for those who want to walk with God, 
for those who want to be pardoned and cleansed and forgiven. My friend, tonight in the pages of Holy Scripture, there's all the comfort in the world and much, much more. You know, I heard the story recently about a, a millionaire somewhere in England and he brought a Rolls Royce car. And whenever the car at last was delivered to his home, he was surprised because there was very little by way of documentation that came with the car. He wanted to know what its torque was and what its brake horsepower was. And, and so he wrote a letter to the manager of Rolls-Royce Motor Company. And he says, I'm just interested to know what is the horsepower of this car. He knew that it had a large engine. And the reply came back with just one word on it. Adequate. Adequate. And by that, Rolls-Royce meant it'll be more than you will ever need. It's got all the horse parts, got all the power, it's got all the torque, it's got all the torque you need, and much more. It's certainly adequate for what you need. And so it is tonight with our Savior, so it is tonight with the Scripture. The work of Jesus Christ is more than adequate. The promises of God are more than sufficient. That's why Peter said in 2 Peter 1 and verse number 4, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. And whenever Paul was writing to the believers in Rome, he said in Romans chapter uh, 15 and verse number 4, he said these wonderful words. Let me read them to you. Whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hoped. And what hope the scriptures bring, even to those who are experiencing bereavement, even to those who have lost loved ones. Paul said in 1 Thessalonians 4, But I would not have you ignorant brethren concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus shall God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, which we which are alive and remain, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and with the trump of God and the voice of the archangel, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Get into the Bible. It's a gold mine of truth. We rob ourselves of comfort whenever we lack our times with God in the secret place. Somebody sent me a link of a a man from the Falls Road, West Belfast. He was standing in Corn Market in Belfast giving his testimony. And he testified to this remarkable change that was wrought in his life. And I don't know anything about him, but I tell you, he was rough and raw around the edges. But he says, you know, over the last year, he says, I haven't cursed, I haven't swore, I haven't drank, I haven't taken drugs because I've come to know Jesus Christ as my Savior. And he said to people, read your Bible. Read your Bible. And it was through reading the Bible that he came to know Christ in a personal way. What a wonderful counsel we find in the Scriptures. What wonderful communion we can have with the Savior. What wonderful consciousness we can have of salvation. And then there's something else that brings a hope to the sinner and a comfort in the gospel. And it's the consolation of the Spirit. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. And it's interesting that one of the words that the Lord Jesus Christ used often in John 14, 15, and 16 to describe the ministry of the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Ghost himself, is the word comforter. I will send you another comforter. When the comforter is come, he shall abide with you forever. And the word that is translated comforter is paraclete. And it just means somebody who draws alongside another. And the Lord's telling his disciples, I'm going up into heaven, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit himself. And he is going to come alongside you. And even more than that, he's going to be in you. And he's going to comfort you with all the comfort 
that God can give. And in verse number 7 of Isaiah 40, it says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, because the Spirit of God bloweth upon it. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Spirit of God is sovereign above all, the breath of God, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter Himself. And it's interesting in our English Bible that the word that is translated Spirit in the New Testament and in the Old Testament comes from a feminine root. Even though the personal pronouns he, him, himself are used many times in John's Gospel. Now, some people may be pointed out that there's a contradiction in that, but I believe the feminine root is used to give the name to the Holy Spirit in Scripture to describe the type of comfort that he brings into the life of a Christian. Isaiah chapter 66 and verse number 13. As one whom his mother comforteth, so will I comfort you and ye shall be comforted in Jerusalem. And you know, in all our human relationships, isn't it true to say that nobody is able to comfort a son or a daughter like a mother, a gracious mother, a kind mother, a compassionate and tender mother, a loving mother, or a godly mother? There's something about the comfort that a mother brings you know, that big man in the United States of America who uh, died in those tragic circumstances as a police officer had his knee upon his neck. And I don't know all about the circumstances of that man's life, but I am told that in his dying moments he cried out for his mother. Isn't that remarkable? That so many people, whenever they are feeling in great need, they will think about their mother. There's something about the tenderness and the compassion and the unconditional love and the sympathy and the tenderness of a mother. It's unparalleled. It's unequaled. And the Savior himself said, as a hen, a mother hen, feminine again, as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings. How often would I have gathered you as a hen gathereth her chicks under her wings, but ye would not. And he's telling Jerusalem, you're missing out on so much comfort and compassion and consolation. I wonder tonight, friend, what are you going through in life? What's your need? Ask God to send his Holy Spirit. Pray that the Comforter will come and give you the grace and the assurance that you need and that he will just draw alongside you in your situation and that the Lord will lift you up tonight and carry you in his bosom. The comfort of the gospel, five component parts, consciousness of salvation, communion with the Savior, the counsel of scripture, the consolation of the spirit, and then lastly, a conception of his sovereignty. Look at verse number 10. Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him because his reward is with him and his work before him. You know, that has reference to the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it also highlights for us the sovereignty of God in all the affairs of life. Our God shall come with strong hand and his arm shall rule for him. That just tells us that he's in control of all that happens. He's sovereign in all of his ways. He reigns, remains, resides, and rules as king of kings and lord of lords. And as that lovely old chorus says, my God is bigger than I am, strongest of all, he is able to make the summer turn into fall. He controls all that happens. His power is plain to see. And I know that I can trust him for with his power, he cares for me. The Savior said, not even a sparrow shall fall to the ground without your father. But he says, take heart, take comfort. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know that he 
watches me. You know, John Newton was once a slave trader, as some of you will know, a blasphemer, a wild and violent man. And then one night God met him in a storm and he was wonderfully saved and wonderfully converted. And he went on, as you know, to write some of the greatest hymns in our English hymn books. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. But another great hymn he wrote is entitled, Be Gone, Unbelief. Be gone, unbelief, my Savior is near. And for my relief will surely appear. By prayer, let me wrestle and he will perform. With Christ in the vessel, I smile at the storm. Though dark be my way, since he is my guide, tis mine to obey, tis his to provide. Though cisterns be broken and creatures all feel, his word he has spoken shall surely prevail. His love in times past forbids me to think. He'll leave me at last in trouble to sink. Each sweet Ebenezer I have in review confirms his good pleasure to help me quite through. Since all that I meet shall work for my good, the bitter is sweet, the medicine food, though painful at present will cease before long. And then, oh, how pleasant the conqueror's song. There was a man who had an understanding of the sovereignty of God, a conception that the Lord shall come with a strong hand and shall rule with his right arm. We rob ourselves of comfort, of peace and assurance whenever we fail to understand something of the sovereignty of God. And yet even amongst evangelical circles, people frown at the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. They misunderstand it, they misappreciate it, they misrepresent it, and yet it's one of the most comforting doctrines in all the word of God for the Christian. I think it was Arthur Pink who said, the doctrine of God's sovereignty is a terror to the natural man, but a wonderful comfort to the spiritual man. The Lord is King. Lift up your voice. Dr. Campbell Morgan, who was the predecessor to Martin Lloyd-Jones in Westminster Chapel, was a wonderful preacher and expositor of God's Word, and he's written many wonderful books. He had a face like granite, and he looked very austere, but he was a man with a tender heart. And he had this to say about the sovereignty of God. He said, the fixed point in the universe, the one unalterable fact, is the throne of God. The fixed point in the universe, the unalterable fact is the throne of God. Our God reigns as king, center and sovereign of the universe. And the apostle Paul said, we have not an high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace and there obtain mercy, and find grace to help in time of need. And my friends, what a wonderful comfort that is tonight, that this sovereign God, this sovereign Savior, who reigns and rules in the center of the universe upon an unalterable, unchangeable throne, invites us to come to that throne and obtain all of the mercy and all of the grace that we need. My God, loves me. He watches over me. He cares for me. And I know tonight that I can trust him. All things work together for good to them that love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. You know, John Newton has written those wonderful hymns and it would serve well just to quote from that great hymn in closing, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound. He says in verse 3, through many dangers, toils, and snares, I have already come. Grace has led me safe thus far. Grace will lead me home. The Lord has promised good to me. His word my hope secures. He will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. Do you, friend, tonight need comfort? Are you a child of God and you need comfort? Well, listen, there's a wonderful comfort in the gospel. Consciousness of God's salvation. What a wonderful thing to know your sins are forgiven. And you've got peace with God. Communion with the Savior. Walk with them. Tell them your burden. Get into fellowship with them. The counsel of Scripture. Lift your Bible. 
get yourself a word from God. Claim its promises. Consolation of the Spirit. Pray that God will guide you and direct you and fill you with the Spirit of God. And then understand this, friend. God is in control. God is sovereign over all. The comfort of the gospel. And you know it's a comfort that lasts for all eternity. I read in Luke's gospel, chapter 16, about the rich man and Lazarus. One lived and died in his sin. The other found Christ somewhere along life's journey as a savior and went into eternity a saved soul, a redeemed sinner. And Abraham said to the rich man concerning Lazarus, now he is comforted and thou art tormented. The comfort of the gospel lasts for time and it lasts for eternity. May we rejoice tonight in this. And I tell you, friend, if you do not know the savior, and you're still not a believer, you're still not a Christian, why not come to Christ tonight? Why not experience his mercy and grace in your life? Take him at his word. Take the promises of, God, of God's word to heart. Claim them for your own. Come to Christ. Call upon the Lord for mercy and for salvation and experience the comfort of the gospel. Thank you so much tonight for listening and let's just sing together a few words from a closing hymn. It's on the, the board or the screen behind me. It's number 314 in my hymn book here. My happy soul rejoices. The sky is bright above. I'll join the heavenly voices and sing redeeming love. Let's stand. Or No, sorry, can't do that. Let's just remain seated. I'll stand and we'll sing the hymn together. 314, my happy soul rejoices.